Welcome back to the Fixed Ops Roundtable, and it is a very exciting time in our industry, and we have the all-star panel assembled by Fixed Ops Magazine, the authority in our industry. We have the publisher, Ron Overs. Ron, welcome back to the event. Thank you so much, Ted. Ron, you've got a great topic and uh, great friends here, and uh, I will uh, get out of the way and let you uh, get things started. Sounds great, Ted. Thank you so much. You know, one of the things that we have uh, seen over the last year is a lot of people wanting to come into dealerships and do training, right? Nothing brand new, but a lot of them think they have a brand new method of doing it or new, new thoughts on how to, how to go about it. When I try to break it up into just a couple of different categories, one is there saying, listen, I can just make you more money. Just let me come in. I'll show you how to get $50,000 more revenue a month. You do the math. You're going to be we wealthy. All you got to do is follow my lead and away you go. The other camp comes in and says, listen, I'm not going to make any promises to you, but the reality is if you just do what I tell you and, and let me just train your people, next thing you know, you're going to be successful. You're going to have a, a shop that's going to do much better than any of the other ones out there today. So fun, you know, as I mentioned, as you get older, you get maybe a little more cynical about these things and start asking a few more questions uh, when, when they come and make their, their grand claims about training. And I thought today's panel would be kind of fun to just talk about what you've experienced in training. What's really worked well for you? Have you, have you brought in outside trainers? What have they done to, to uh, really help your business? And, and what was their focus? Was their focus more on a process to show you a better way of doing things than you were doing today? Or just, you know, helping you institute your own process that you have in your stores? Or was it, the focus was, listen, here's our most profitable jobs we need more of these sold and uh, focus on certain, certain, you know, different uh, repair uh, pieces that will actually, you know, make your business money faster and, and growth. But let's just go right around and start with that. Tully, right next to me here, let's tell me about your experiences with, uh, with training. So I think training starts with this. First is, is, is your store broken or not broken? If your store is broken, then you start kind of like 101 and you bring trainers in to kind of tell you what's going on. But I think a lot of stores are not broken. And I think that when you look at, when you start your training pr procedures is first, you must have KPIs that you are checking with and are monitoring at all times, because that is the key. Did the training pay off or not? Is your training processes? We all understand. We all struggle with processes in the driveway. Why won't they go out and check the car in, right? Why won't they ask? the customer for their email address, right? These are simple things that I don't need to pay a trainer for. But if we have processes in place and we have ways to help them succeed and make more money for them and their families, because we all ultimate goal is we are truly in the repeat and referral business and we sell hours, is how do we help our riders be more successful in selling those hours? And that's the key issue when you look at a store. So I say, is your process is right. If they're not, start there. Two, help your riders overcome objections in the service drive. Help them sell things that we'd sell our family members. That's where I would start first. Makes a lot of sense, Tully. It really does. You're absolutely right. Definition first. Do you need the training? What's broke? What's not broke? How is it going to work? Sir, I'm not skipping you. I'm going to jump over to Scott and I'm going to come back to you toward the end there. Scott, how about yourself? What are your experiences? I have to agree with Tully, is the store broken or not broken? Because that's very important as to what kind of training you need. Um, you know, everybody's got the next best thing, but nobody's really reinventing the wheel. And the bottom line is if you have good processes in place or put good processes in place or somebody can come in and train good processes, then the profits will come with that. So you can't, can't chase the profits. Uh, you'll, you'll, you'll just never get where you need to go. And uh, the biggest thing for me bringing a trainer in is I know what we need to do. But I don't have the time to sit with everybody one-on-one -on -one all day, every day and train them. So to bring somebody in that can do that and not to mention they'll listen to them where they see me and hear me every day. They're like, ah, whatever, you know, that guy's talking again. But you bring somebody in and they really help you with your processes. You need to have an idea of what you want already and they need to help you implement those processes and maybe fine tune them. And that's another key thing about somebody coming in to train. Do they listen to you and what you want and where you want to go? And do they follow that? Or do they just try to do something cookie cutter 
which doesn't work for anybody, really. Uh, you're just spinning your wheels there. Absolutely. Sean, how about yourself? What are your experiences? Well, and I think everybody knows on the panel that I've had a good two, three year relationship with John Fairchild. And, and, and really, I think with trainers or outside vendors or, and he hates the term, but anybody can come in and jack effective labor rate up by jacking the door rate up or flushing somebody's wallet until they're blue in the face. I think more than anything else, and really it goes back to what Tilly and Scott said, and I know Ed and I work a lot together, we talk a lot, is you have to train the trainer. If the service manager himself can't train the advisors, I don't care who trains what, when they leave, it's going to stop. It's, it is about KPIs and holding people accountable. And I think that's our biggest thing. And to Scott's point, you know, as we grow to 20 and 23 and 24 stores, you don't have time. You don't have time to spend hours upon hours with, with, with the managers, let alone the advisors. So again, for me, it's all about training the trainers. If the, tra if the trainer can't be trained, then that's your problem. Really good point. Ed, how about yourself, your experiences? A lot of good stuff being brought up, but a lot of times trainers and, and, and Sean said, hey, you got to train the trainer because it's got to stay behind. Um, but a, a lot of times when a trainer comes in, they're telling you that we got to do these things that we already knew that we should be doing. And unfortunately, we've lost sight of it because we've gotten caught up in the day to day activities. And as soon as they start talking about when you do this, when you do that, the light bulbs go off. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, you're right. It isn't new stuff to us. It's stuff that we should have already been doing. But unfortunately, we quit paying attention to it. But ultimately, what it boils down to is anything that we pay attention to improves. And so if we set those goals to whatever they may end up being and we stay focused on them rather than set 25 of them so that you can't focus on those 25, set the four or five that you want to focus on. And then those become a habit over time and then set four or five new ones. You may have to come back and refresh some of them. But setting goals is really where you get the most bang for your buck from. But then also, we're never done training. So we always got to be constantly trying to improve. Like J Sean was talking about using John Fairchild. John Fairchild comes here. Well, I can learn from him. He can learn from us. It, it all goes back and forth. And then we can share it with our people. He can share it with his. But we're never done training. So true. Sarah, those are good words, aren't they? They're never done training. Sounds like you got a job for a while. Huh? <laughs> yes. And, you know, it's. It's exciting being, you know, the the really the trainer in the training company on this panel to get the feedback from all these wonderful influencers in our automotive community. Um, you know, I want to share a little bit too, and, and this isn't specific to automotive, but touching on the points that they were mentioning, sometimes it isn't about the trainer or the training company. It's purely about the relationship and the partnership with the person that you are working with and what you can accomplish together. And so I just want to say, you know, for me personally, I'm an equestrian. I, I'm an avid horseback rider and I'm always looking to improve. But one of the pitfalls that a lot of automotive dealers and myself included have sometimes fallen into is the cult of personality trainer. And so in my equestrian career at one point, I was partnered up with somebody that was very, very reputable, had an amazing reputation, had been a winner, had done all these wonderful things in the equestrian community. But what I was finding in my own personal results with them was that I was really getting ignored. And really the goal at the end of the day for them was pure winning. They just wanted to churn out more riders that could be competitive in the competition arena, but they weren't actual horsemen. They weren't really people that understood what it meant to be an equestrian and the bond and the actual personal growth that needed to get to that winning place. And so I was really struggling at different points and not able to really, really figure out why until I switched to another trainer. And this trainer opened my eyes and I really found, wow, you know, there's a lot of pitfalls and a lot of gaps in what I thought I knew and what I needed to do to continue to grow and learn. And having that reset button, being able to come back to center, actually really develop those skills that are needed to then become a better competitor, that's made all the difference. And so my my view and quantum fives view of my company that's really the big key right there is we are looking to improve the overall skills of an organization whatever organization that we come in in order to have that overall lift and like ed and and scott and sean and tolly all touched on each store has different processes very different goals but it's up to us as trainers to partner with you to align that same mission and what your goals are 
such key points made there. There's no question about it. Um, I've been involved with auto dealers for, you know, for 30 years and uh, to come in and train and try to get, you know, so many times we'll come in and they'll say, well, here, you know, role play and I'll give them a word track or we'll talk through something and they'll be like, well, Ron, if I could say it like that, you know, I'd sell everybody. And it's like, yeah, but see, these are my words. You know, you have to believe in the product you're selling. If you don't believe in front end alignments, you're not going to sell front end alignments, right? I mean, you, you've got to believe the product that you're selling. So, so much of training that I've found is, you know, getting the, the core belief in what they're doing, that it's important, that it's significant. And that without this, the customer may be left high and dry out on 95, you know, the worst possible such scenario. You know, we, we want to get them in a in a place that they know that they're coming in for service you know not just to not just to take care of that you know oh yeah it's got five thousand miles and they need oil change but that the car really we're here to make sure that it's going to be safe and that it's going to work exactly the way you want it all the time no matter when you're driving that car and uh, that's going to make such a big difference if the training can be you know that focus and that specific and i know quantum five you're big on that right or you do the a need assessment right find out where that person is with rather than try to jam the same, you know, selling scenario down, you know, each one of your, you know, advisors or whoever you're training, um, you know, it just simply doesn't work today. Um, they don't believe your product. They'll do it for a while. Then they're going to stop. That, it's just that fast. So there's no question about it. You know, just spinning off of this just a little bit. But, you know, how is this potential part shortages that we see pretty much all over the country? How is that going to affect your training and your in how you you know how you actually work with your service advisors to make sure that they're communicating to their customers you know hey it may not go exactly the way you thought but you know this is what we're going to experience over the next you know period of time to keep your car out on the road tell you mentioned a few situations you've had yeah i think that this this shortage is really you know a thorn in our side but now what we need to talk about, it's not as much as about selling the product as we all do a lot of tremendous amount of warranty repairs. It's all about keeping the customer updated. It's talking about communication. And we all sit there and say, God, I just can't figure it out because we don't do it, right? Are we texting? Are we calling? Are we emailing? Whatever the customer wants. It comes down to what we really are in the customer repeat and referral business. And if we have issues where parts are gonna be weeks, if not months, right? We have to make sure we keep that up all the time with the customer. And when we look at our CSI, which stands for customer supplies income, because we are in the repeat referral retention program, is we must find out that first. What are we doing? What are we doing to communicate to the customer what's happening with their car via, all the different options we have. And today we have so many great options, making sure that procedure happens every time in your store. Yeah, so true. Scott, what are any experiences you've had with that, with part shortages and things like that, how you're handling it? Uh, what, just like Tully said, he's absolutely right. You have to maintain communication with that customer. And even if it's gonna be four months, touch them at least once a week, let them know you haven't forgotten about them. Still working to get their parts in. We do everything we can on the back end with Subaru to get the part here as quickly as possible. They've been very proactive about, you know, especially if you have one that's uh, customers getting a little antsy or something, they'll they'll really jump in there and try to try to get it to you. We had them pull a part off the assembly line the other day and sent to us on one that we needed. Uh, so they've actually rented entire container ships to ship parts and things like that. So. Uh, but the main thing is communication with the customer. We live in a real time world now and they want to know everything real time. You know, texting is a huge thing anymore with every generation, really. And and people have got to get on board with that. You also need to communicate with the customer and find out how do you want to be communicated with? Some people still prefer a phone call. Some people email, some people text and the majority are text anymore. But confirm that with them as well, you know, put it in their file so that you always try to communicate with them that way first and then other avenues if you need to but but yeah communication is it's just critical it, it is because otherwise they're sitting at home going man when's my car going to be ready nobody wants that stress nobody wants that anxiety so you got to try to alleviate that as much as you possibly can and uh, 
and you know, loan cars are another option. Although our loan car fleet's down because we've had to sell some of those, but uh, it's just a struggle all the way around. But yeah, communication is the number one thing. Yeah. Uh, keep in touch with them. Keep them up to date. Sean, what else can you add to this? What else? Do you well, see? again, I can I can say the same thing as Tully and and, and Scott both and, and feed on it. But there, there's two things. It's funny, and I think I said on the last panel we were all together. You know, 2008. For those of us that have been around a while. You know, when they stopped selling cars and there was a car shortage, well, we were fine. Well, in 2009, we found out that, well, there was nothing for us to service because they didn't sell any cars. Well, they ran short on cars a year ago. And now we're finally catching up on parts. But as far as the communication side of it, CSI is a big part of it. I mean, we, listen, the, the client, it is what it is. You can communicate until you're dead, until you're bit, you know, beat blue in the face. But four months out, five, six months waiting for a transmission, there's really no good word. And you know, but I got to say, I've, I've said this now for my 28 years being in the car business. I've offered this for 28 years and I've had to pay it yet. The first time that I have a client that says, hey, can you have Ed stop calling me so much? I'm going to give them my next paycheck. Every advisor I've hired in 28 years, I've made that bet with and I haven't paid it yet. You know, so to the point, you can't communicate enough, it, whether it's text message. And, you know, to your point, Scott, every every week, listen, I don't care if you said it every day at 2.30. Hey, listen, I haven't forgot about you. We're still waiting. Hey, I haven't forgot about you. It's better than the other phone call where, as Tully said, it's communication. We're guessing at it because we just don't do it. Right. So, Ed, do you do a lot of your guys, all your technicians are set up with texting, obviously, and they're they're communicating with that. Any other ways they're doing or anything innovative that they're doing to, you know, keep the customer calm, keep them uh, moving? Well, like Scott said, you got to find out what's their best form of communication. And for us, it, it, we're, we text about 95% of our customers because that is what they want to communicate with. But it works well for us that we can retain all of that. But one of the things going back to this being a part shortage is the communication really starts at time of write up, if not sooner, if you can make it happen sooner when they make the appointment or whatever the situation may be great. But if your first point of contact with them is that time of write up, that's where the communication starts. And that way you can set them up that if the vehicle is still safe to drive, that they continue to drive the vehicle after it's diagnosed. But a key element to that is time of service. If we bring them in, we ride them up and it takes a week to check it out. And then we call them, tell them to come get your vehicle. That doesn't go over too well. But so the communication starts in the beginning and then the process carries it through. And with that, we can overcome the obstacles of the part shortages. Very good. Sarah, with your training, do you, I mean, obviously with all the things that you do, do you, do, do you help them in, in their training of how to actually use those devices so they actually get clear messages across to people that uh, they get? Yes, yes. In fact, you know, listening to all these gentlemen, it really made my busy heart proud because communication was the big takeaway with all of the feedback that they were providing about communication being so important. I will add that one of the other components that's so important within this is to make sure that your dealership is not siloed in your communication. So one of the pitfalls that often happens with customer experience is that we all kind of treat the other department or treat the customer when there's an issue as another department's problem. So if it's parts, back order or, or shortage or whatever, you know, the service department is quick to be like, well, parts, the, you'll have to check in with them or even the sales department or BDC or whoever it is. One of the big pieces with Quantum, we have leadership, we have service, we have sales, we have BDC training. One of the biggest components about it is this unified dealership approach that really looks at the customer experience from their viewpoint, which is, I don't care whose responsibility it is, you're who I'm doing business with, I don't care about the respective departments, I just want my car fixed. I just want my car you know, bought, I want whatever it is, that's what we have to focus on is the customer need. And so having that perception at the leadership level where all of us as a group, and that's one of the biggest pieces that I was so proud of with BDC, is that we often have to look at a customer situation and solve the problem using multiple departments. You have to collaborate together and look at it and go, all right, what's best for the customer? If I can't get the parts, well, is this a pull ahead opportunity? Is this something that the sales department, maybe we get them in a different car? Could we have an opportunity where they're happy or new warranty, new vehicle? Uh, is there other options available from service or sales that we can try to pull into this to make the customer happy? Those are all pieces that are so important to our training is having a unified approach that really is customer centric. But then also, like you mentioned, having those communication messaging uh, messages 
we customize those based on what the client's needs are. So there's just a lot of different opportunities there to address the part shortages, but it all starts with your people. Really good points. Yeah, there's no question. And, you know, and when you're saying that, I'm saying amen, because I've been through all those as a consumer too, right? You know, where you're just, you're waiting on a part or you're waiting on something and you don't, I don't want to talk to three people. You want to talk to one person. You want them to do the chasing, solve the problem, make it right for you and, uh, and, and, and move forward. There's no question. All right. So now the year ahead, right? We, we, we've gone through some incredible times the last few years. If someone jumped in the jumped into fixed operations the last three years, they say, is it always this chaotic? I mean, when, when is the, the norm that you talked about? When does that actually happen? Because, you know, you think about what we've been through and uh, it, the last three years have been just just playing crazy with with all the demands. I mean, you know, first, you know, everybody had masks on and we're fogging cars up to kill germs that we can't see that we're you know, that we're, we don't know what we're you know, you don't know what the next thing is coming. But we kind of do have to anticipate what's coming. So as you look ahead to the year, you know, the year 2022, the rest of the year. What do you see are the things that you have to be careful or mindful of to really get your fixed operations going in the right direction or keep going in the right direction? Telly, how about yourself? Well, I think that when you look at the first quarter of this year, I kind of sense that this is going to be what's going to be trending for the rest of the year. So here's a couple things. First, EVs. EVs for the fixed ops department are really going to be a hard time for us. Why? Because we sell tires, tire rotations, and cabin filters. And we have a lot of very expensive products to fix inside the car. So I think that one, what does that mean? Every customer, every tire, every cabin filter is a must. No customer can leave the driveway saying, eh, I'm not sure if I want to buy the tire from you or Costco. No, we have to make sure that we were 100% all in for every customer. I think two, Parts department is going to be like this. I think we're going to have part shortages for a while. I just don't think this is going to get done here in the next quarter or the next, you know, the end of this year. So we have to have a process in place, as a lot of us are already doing now, is that's going to become the new norm. I love that Sarah said, well, set it up beforehand. Talk about what's going to happen before the car arrives. Uh, you know, Ed said, talk to him in the service drive. You realize that recall we have to inspect and then that part might be blank. These are things that we want to train on because this is the new norm. Now, the great part about it is, is I see that when customers and cars are getting more advanced, I see that we're going to grow service departments. I don't think we're going backwards. I think because we realize if your store culture is repeat and referral in the retention business, we're still going to grow our stores. And that is the fun part of 2022. Good points. Scott, how about yourself? What do you see in the year ahead? I, I'd agree with Tully. I think the first quarter has uh, given us a glimpse of what's to come. And uh, EVs, of course, are on everybody's mind. Um, still going to be a long time before the internal combustion engines go away and we'll get service business out of them. Right now with the current vehicle shortage, people are keeping their cars longer. So we have more business actually in service, more customer pay business and need to be sure we're capitalizing on that. And, and to the point about setting the tone at the initial visit, that's critical, you know, to let them know, yes, we're going to inspect your car. Yes, this part may be have to be ordered and, you know, they have been on back order. So don't don't uh, just blast them with that after they you know expect to pick their car up that evening and go home with it. Uh, it may not be the case. So you got to be uh, very transparent with them, uh, very transparent with everything you're doing to try to get the parts here and everything the manufacturers are doing to try to get the parts to you. But yeah, it's it, it, it again. It just all comes back to communication. You got to communicate with that customer. You got to be upfront with them. You can't try to hide it. But uh, as far as EVs and everything else, just like Tully said, it's critical that we do good inspections on these cars. That we watch for ones that need tires. That uh, you know we're selling everything we can on them because uh, you know there's not that much you know not much not much to pick from on them. So maybe some wiper blades every once in a while too, but, uh, uh, but, and, and the other cars that are still coming in, the internal combustion cars, we got to really uh, improve our MPI process and make sure we're 
talking to those customers. And we also got to sell the good. You can't just blast them every time they come in, you know, point out all the things that are good on their car or give them an idea. Hey, this is kind of in the yellow. Maybe next visit, you're going to have to think about addressing this or something like that. Build trust with them there too. So they will keep coming back to see you and that you can keep that retention up, which is going to be critical. Good points. Sean, how about yourself? What do you see in the year ahead? So in the year ahead, we, we still really started planning in about the end of Q2, beginning of Q3 of 2021, where our shift was, so we're a 2,000 a month business. You know, we sell 2,000 vehicles a month, it seems month in, month out, where we were selling 13, 1,400 new and 600 used. That is completely switched now, where we're selling 600 new and 1,400 used. So you know, we weren't marketing well to used, and I'm no different than any other service department. Our retention on used is horrid. It's half of what the new is. So we've really, really started focusing on Q1 on the marketing and the advertising for, for used cars. And as everybody knows, you know, we, we have been pretty publicized. We bought three Mighty Auto Parts franchises. So the purpose was going into the fact that we knew used cars were going to be part of it. And when a Honda comes across one of my Stellantis stores, I don't have to call AutoZone. I can call myself. So our, our complete focus really started the end of Q2 of 2021, Q3, Q4. And we're, we're actually reaping the benefits from it. We had a meeting this morning. I mean, our mighty side of it has done very well and is aggressively growing well because of our internal used cars, which is what we're selling more of. And if the used cars go away, we're in real trouble a year from now. Really good points. Ed, how about yourself? What do you see ahead? Well, it's a lot of what we talked about, but I'm going to tie, tie it together with a few different angles. Sure. Forever, you, uh, new cars has been the face of our dealerships. They are not the face of our dealerships anymore. Used cars is the face of our dealerships. So that's multi brands. And we have to focus on the recon of those vehicles and making sure that we're putting the best product out there possible and not just our brand. It's every brand that we sell. And it's also an opportunity for us to. So we all had to shift to being a used car store and we have to make that our, our primary focus. But it's also our opportunity to really embrace the fixed ops department like it's never been embraced before because the demand is here and the supply is here. So there's as much out there as we want and we can't just go through the motions and say, okay, well, we can't get that part. We're not gonna be able to make that happen. We gotta find resources. We gotta find used parts. We gotta do whatever we can to keep these cars on the road because cars are consumables and they are being consumed at a rate faster than being replaced. And so we have to extend that period out on these vehicles and we gotta find ways to do that with or without parts. The, uh, and then the aftermarket has always came in on something that we've lacked in. They've always filled the voids that we didn't do a good job of taking and, and making things happen with. Well, with EVs coming, it's our opportunity to get ahead of the aftermarket because we have all the, the training up front. We have it. So we have our opportunity to be out in front of everybody with EVs. And so for us, it's, it's, I look forward to what's coming. We can, we can still become, or we can still be a strong used car store, even after inventory comes back. As we build our service departments, we can continue to really drive things home as things come back into place. And then we can own the market with EV if we put the infrastructure in place now, rather than later. And I know Sean and his guys are doing that and Tilly and his guys, mm -hmm. I'm sure Scott is as well. That's our opportunity to get out in front. Really good points. You know, you see that so many people are out there right now saying we got to sell tires, 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 right? Now, how many used cars come with brand new tires? Well, not many of them, right? Right. They're, 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 they're half worn out already, right? So, I mean, the good news is to bring it to their attention. Great news is, you know, your used car is in great shape. It's got 530 seconds at 330 seconds. Okay. We have a decision to make. So let's get started on it today. So you know what you're talking about. Absolutely. You know, Used cars come back for service a lot faster than a new car does. Yeah. You know, my, my son who works for uh, General Motors was telling me, he said, you know, they spend hundreds of thousands of dollars of deciding what kind of tires to put on those cars. And then some guy's going to run down to Costco and buy a tire, you know, be the pro and tell them, look it, let me show you how we get the original equipment tire that makes sense for this vehicle back on your car. So it stops properly, that it handles well in the rain. Not something that's maybe 50 bucks cheaper that ends up, you know, in the curb, you know, uh, rather than stopping properly. You know, it doesn't take a lot to sell the right tire to that person once they understand the perspective on that. Exactly. Great. 
Hey, Ted. Uh, lots, of, lots of notes on this panel. Uh, in particular, a lot of the training uh, comments that Sarah shared with the group, really, really relevant. And Ed, to, to bring it home, what you just said about the, the face of our dealerships changing, right? It has changed. It is. We have to recognize that. And you're, you're addressing it head on. And so, uh, you know, both used reconditioning and fixed ops. And um, I, we're in the right space. So love it. Ron, great job. Hey, thanks for putting me around smart people. It works really well. You know, it's uh, it's great to do. I think they gravitate you, to you, Ron. And uh, Ron, I heard a couple t uh, potential topics here for uh, the next uh, issue of Fixed Ops Magazine. Uh, tell us a little bit more about what you got going on there at Fixed Ops Magazine. And, and if there happens to be somebody who does not get it, uh, how they can go ahead and subscribe. <laughs> If you don't get this free magazine, okay, you're either not a car nerd, okay, which means, you know, you, you got to get a new hobby because, you know, bottom line is Fixed Ops Magazine is, a, is just a great source to really, really just find out what's going on in service departments today. Um, you know, this, this next issue here that we got coming out right about this time um, is on parts, right? Because, I mean, what a, what a topic today, right, for that. And talking about dealerships that have excelled in, in having the right parts available so service can actually get done. But, you know, we get we got to think 30 articles that we boil down to 10 for this next issue. So we find the best of the best articles and say, guys, read these. It takes five minutes to read an article. We try to keep them at a thousand words so that you could you can read these things that they got pictures and graphics. So you'll follow along, you know, so at the end of it, you can say, aha, there's an aha moment in there, you know, this is. Okay, now I get it. Now th that's something I can apply to my business. So yeah, the next issue is it's parts focused, and we really try to just take the best. And, and many of you have contributed, and I really appreciate that uh, to just stories that really say, "Is there a better way of doing it than I'm doing it today?" And if there is, why am I doing it the way I'm doing it? Let's fix it. Let's change it. Let's make it better. And we go. So thank you for all your contributions. Uh, the magazine is a blast. I really enjoy doing it. And, uh, you know, we've got a lot of new things coming out. So it's going to be exciting year ahead. And, Ron, it's online as well at fixedopsmag.com, scrolling in the ticker. And if you have an idea for an article, um, you can reach Ron at uh, ron at fixedopsmag.com. And, uh, again, he, he picks the best of the best, but uh, we're looking for new ideas constantly. So Absolutely. Always looking for new ones. Thank you, Ted. Yeah, want to thank everybody. Uh, Ron Overs, the publisher at Fixed Ops Magazine. Uh, our good friends, uh, Ed Roberts. Uh, Ed, thank you so much for everything you do for the industry. Sarah Van Tyne, great stuff, great content. Sure. Keep it coming. Uh, Sean Kingry, uh, again, amazing information. So, Sean, thank you for being thank much you. more involved with this roundtable than in past ones. And Scott Gregg, same with you. Wow, great stuff coming out of you. And uh, I don't know what to say, Ron, but I think – if you put up a poll on LinkedIn, maybe someday in the future, on maybe who should be on the next cover and put some of the folks from this panel, uh, it would be tough to share that vote. But I know that Tully Williams is very worthy of He's the cover there, of the magazine. So uh, maybe at some point someday. And uh, Tully, thank you for all you do for the industry. <laughs> Love it. Thanks, Deli. Ron Overs and the panel uh, with Fixed Ops Magazine here today at the Fixed Ops Roundtable. Thank you, Ted.